Please join me in welcoming Joe and Steve. Hey guys, thanks so much for coming out tonight. Hey Joe. I uh I want to thank the Somerville Theater and Porter Square Books for having us. This is great, you know. It's a it's a one of a life it's a once in a lifetime experience for me. I've never done this with that before. Um you it's know, a it's a great really thing cool. for me too. Um so so I'm I'm going to read a bit from my dad's new book, The Institute, um, to kick things off. You know, uh, the first time I ever did a public reading was for my first novel, Heart Shaped Box, which came out in 2007. And I, I wound up doing a reading in front of a hometown crowd at Water Street Books in Exeter, New Hampshire. Yeah. And I, I was scared shitless, you know, because I had never been out there in front of, like, there were 120 people, and I had never been out there in front of a big crowd. I didn't have a lot of experience with public speaking. So I was pretty nervous, you know, shaky, and my mouth was dry. And uh, that book... That book is the story of a heavy metal musician who has a collection of grotesque artifacts. He's got like a tray pan human skull and a witch's confession and a snuff film. And he hears about a woman selling a ghost online and decides he wants it. And if you've ever seen even like a single horror film, you know what a terrible idea that is. Um, but he does it anyway and, um, and then spends the next 300 pages regretting it. But in any event, um, so at the beginning of the story, he's in a relationship with this young woman. They've been together for a while and the relationship is on the rocks. And uh, the language is pretty salty. But it was an eight in the evening reading. And I, I took a look at the crowd, and it pretty much looked like it was all grown-ups, and I thought, hell, I'm just going to read it the way I wrote it. So they're talking, they're in conversation, Jude and his girlfriend, Georgia, you know, and she says, you're a sympathetic son of a bitch, you know that? And he says, you want sympathy? Go fuck James Taylor! <laughs> and the moment after I said it, like eight little kids popped up in the audience. <laughs> Like, middle schoolers, all of them. And the kids were like... <laughs> and their parents were like... <laughs> but after that, I decided to just let my freak flag fly. The... <laughs> the moral of this story is if you brought small children to this event, <laughs> we can't be on the hook for your bad parenting. <laughs> So my dad's new novel is called The Institute. Um, it's an absolute fucking blast. I, I have been, my wife and I have been reading it to each other. Um, and at this, at the, at in this particular evening, we're 15 pages from the ending. So I regret to inform you I won't be able to complete this reading. I'm going to go backstage and finish. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> no, I'm going to read a portion from the middle. Um, there's a place called the Institute in the deep woods of Maine. A number of children are being held there for sinister reasons. And one of them, a boy named Luke, has just managed to effect his escape by wriggling under a chain link fence. But he's not safe yet because he's got a, a tracking device embedded in his ear. So I'm just going to read a couple pages from the middle. He was out. Luke swayed to his knees and cast a wild look back, sure he'd see all the lights coming on, not just in the lounge, but in the hallways and the cafeteria, and in their glow he would see running figures, caretakers with their zap sticks unholstered and turned up to maximum power. There was no one. He got to his feet and began to run blindly, the vital next step 
orientation, forgotten in his panic. He might have run into the woods and become lost there before reason reasserted itself, except for the sudden scorching pain in his left heel as he came down on a sharp rock and realized he had lost one of his sneakers in that final desperate lunge. Luke returned to the fence, bent, retrieved it, and put it on. His back and buttocks only smarted, but that final cut into his calf had been deeper and burned like a hot wire. His heartbeat slowed, and clear thinking returned. Once you're out, go level with the trampoline, Avery had said, relaying the second of Marine's steps. Put your back to it, then turn right one medium-sized step. That's your direction. You only have a mile or so to go, and you don't need to keep in a perfectly straight line. What you're aiming for is pretty big, but try your best. Later in bed that night, Avery had said that maybe Luke could use the stars to guide him. He didn't know about that stuff himself. All right then, time to go. But there was one other thing he had to do first. He reached up to his right ear and felt the small circle embedded there. He remembered someone, maybe Iris, maybe Helen, saying the implant hadn't hurt her because her ears were already pierced. Only piece pierced earrings unscrewed. Luke had seen his mother do it. This one was fixed in place. Please, God, don't let me have to use the knife. Luke steeled himself, worked his nails under the curved upper edge of the tracker and pulled. His earlobe stretched and it hurt, hurt plenty, but the tracker remained fixed. He let go, took two deep breaths, memories of the immersion tank recurring as he did so, and pulled again, harder. The pain was worse this time, but the tracker remained in place and time was passing. The West Residence Wing, looking strange from this unfamiliar angle, was still dark and quiet. But for how long? He thought about pulling again, but that would only be postponing the inevitable. Maureen had known. It was why she left him the paring knife. He took it from his pocket, being careful not to pull out the thumb drive as well, and held it in front of his eyes in the scant starlight. He felt for the sharp edge with the ball of his thumb, then reached across his body with his left hand and pulled down on his earlobe, stretching it as far as it would go, which was not very. He hesitated, taking a moment to let himself really understand he was on the free side of the fence. The owl hooted again, a sleepy sound. He could see fireflies stitching the dark, and even in this moment of extremity realized they were beautiful. Do it fast, he told himself. Pretend you're slicing a piece of steak, and don't scream no matter how much it hurts. You cannot scream. Luke put the top of the blade against the top of his earlobe on the outside and stood that way for a few seconds that felt like a few eternities. Then he lowered the knife. I can't. You must. I can't. Oh, God, I have to. He placed the edge of the knife against that tender, unarmored flesh again and pulled down at once before he had time to do more than pray for the edge to be sharp enough to do the job in a single stroke. The blade was sharp, but his strength failed him a little at the last moment, and instead of coming off, the earlobe dangled by a shred of gristle. At first, there was no pain, just the warmth of blood flowing down the side of his neck. Then the pain came. It was as if a wasp, one as big as a pint bottle, had stung him and injected its poison. Luke inhaled in a long, sibilant hiss, grasped the dangling earlobe, and pulled it off like skin from a chicken drumstick. He bent over it, knowing he had gotten the damn thing, but needing to see it anyway, needing to be positive. It was there. Luke made sure he was even with the trampoline. He put his back to it, then turned a step, a medium one, he hoped, to the right. Ahead of him was the dark bulk of the northern main woods, stretching for God only knew how many miles. He looked up and spotted the Big Dipper with one corner star straight ahead. Keep following that, he told himself. That's all you have to do. It won't be straight on till morning either. She told Avery it's only a mile or so, and then it's on to the next step. Ignore the pain in your shoulder blades, the worst pain in your calf, and the worst pain of all in your Van Gogh ear. Ignore the way your arms and legs are trembling. Get going. But first, he drew his fisted right hand back to his shoulder and flung a scrap of flesh in which the tracker was still embedded over the fence. He heard, or imagined he heard, 
the small click it made as it struck the asphalt surrounding, surrounding the playground's paltry excuse for a basketball court. Let them find it there. He began to walk, eyes up, and fixed on that one single star. Oh. That's my son, and I love him like mad. <laughs> That's great. I want to say a shout out too to Aaron Mackey and to my friend Paul Tremblay, who's in the audience. And if you haven't read his book, Growing Things, Head Full of Ghosts, you should. And check out the Laura podcast. Very cool. Well, thank you all for coming. And of course, we're all here together now and we're having a good time. And <clears throat> later, you'll all have to go home in the dark. <laughs> Yeah, you can laugh about it now. <laughs> but you know, those insurance reports say, I read this on the net, so it has to be true. That one in 50 of you will have forgotten. You're so goddamn excited you forgot to lock your door. <laughs> I won't say that anybody could be in there, but anybody could be in your house. Upstairs, <laughs> in the bathroom. <laughs> now I want you to think tonight when you go in to the bathroom. Was that shower curtain pulled? <laughs> I left or not? Listen, uh, I want to read from Joe's book, <clears throat> which is on sale now and. We signed a bunch of them, but you can always buy more. <laughs> it's called Full Throttle. And, uh, yeah. Next week, we're going to be on the New York Times bestseller list together. How cool is that? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I want to read a little bit from Joe's introduction, because that way I don't have to do any uh, backstory, but also because it's about me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you think about it, Joe, this is really fucking conceited, but <laughs> I'm going to do it anyway. We had a new monster every night. I had this book I love, Bring on the Bad Guys. It was a big, chunky paperback collection of comic book stories, and as you might guess from the title, it wasn't much concerned with heroes. It was instead an anthology of tales about the worst of the worst, vile psychopaths with names like the abomination and faces to match. My dad had to read that book to me every night. He didn't have a choice. It was one of the, those Shahrazad type deals. If he didn't read to me, I wouldn't stay in bed. I'd slip out from under my Empire Strikes Back quilt and roam the house in my Spider-Man underoos, <laughs> soggy thumb in my mouth, and my filthy comfort blanket tossed over one shoulder. <laughs> I could roam all night if the mood took me. My father had to keep reading until my eyes were barely open, and even then he could only escape by saying he was going to step out for a smoke and he'd be right back. My mother insists I develop childhood insomnia because of trauma. I took a snow shovel to the face at the age of five. Actually, Joe, you were only two. Mm. <laughs> and spent a night in the hospital. Where and were you when I was proofreading this thing? <laughs> I was writing my next book, son. <laughs> In that era of lava lamps, shag carpets, and smoking on airplanes, parents weren't allowed to stay overnight with their injured children in the hospital. The story goes that I awoke alone in the middle of the night and couldn't find them and tried to escape. And this part I can testify to is absolutely true. Nurses caught me wandering the halls bare-assed and put me in a crib and strapped a net down over the top to keep me in. 
I screamed until my voice gave out. The story is so wonderfully horrible and gothic, I think we all need to assume it's true. I only hope the crib was black and rusty and that one of the nurses whispered, it's all for you, Damien. <laughs> I loved the subhumans in Bring on the Bad Guys, demented creatures who shrieked unreasonable demands, raged when they didn't get their way, ate with their hands, and yearned to bite their enemies. Of course I loved them. I was six. We had a lot in common. <laughs> my dad read me those stories, his fingertip moving from panel to panel so my weary gaze could follow the action. If you ask me what Captain America sounded like, I could have told you. He sounded like my dad. So did the dread Dormammu. So did Sue Richards, the invisible woman. She sounded like my dad doing a girl's voice. <laughs> they were all my dad, every one of them. So, thank you. <laughs> I forgot. I had something else bookmarked that's very, very short. Do I have it here? Uh, let's see. Sugar. Wait a minute. No, that's not it. Here it is. Joe wrote a story called Late Returns that's in uh, the book Full Throttle, which is on sale now at fine bookstores everywhere. <laughs> and uh, I just wanted to read this, this one paragraph. It's about a guy who runs a bookmobile, and it's a time travel story. Uh, about people who get books from the future uh, when they come in, their late returns. Uh, the people who come in are time travelers because the bookmobile is a time machine. Says, um, when you consider that, well, just imagine if you lived in the 50s and liked the twists in Agatha Christie novels. Now imagine that right before you died, you had a chance to read Gone Girl. You die for sure of happiness, for all we know, that's what happened to the man you saw today. I can think of worse ways to go than with a good book in my hand. Okay, it's question time. Yeah. So we have a bunch of questions from you, but I have questions of my own that I wanted to hit first now that I've got him on stage. Have any of you ever guys, any of you guys seen that show Between Two Ferns? <laughs> uh, originally, I thought I'd, originally, I'd, I, I thought I'd, you know, ride my dad, do my best Zach Giliff, uh, what the fuck is, uh, impression, and, you know, give him a lot of questions like, you were once on the cover of Time. What else do you have in common with Donald Trump? <laughs> <laughs> or, or... That would be fucking nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but then I, got, then I got thinking about it, and I... I I, I guess I decided I actually didn't want to spend an hour teasing you, um, which is which is disappointing, I know, but I, I thought maybe um, there were some actual questions that I'm kind of curious about that I could, you know, um, that I could ask you now, you know, in a private, intimate way <laughs> in front of 800 people. So, um, so I guess my, my the th this, this could be very bad because <laughs> you know, he's, he could really go in here. He knows a lot. I guess, I guess the first thing I'm wondering is how much do you need to know and what do you need to know before you start writing a novel? How, how, what did you, how many pieces did you have to have already in your head? Because I know you don't work by outline, that you don't plan ahead. What did you know that gave you the confidence to start the Institute, that told you it was ready? How much of the story did you have? I really didn't have any of the story. I had an idea from a long time ago. Um, I, I don't think that I want to say that because it's a spoiler, the stuff that happens toward the very end of the book. I had an image of... Well, I'll tell you this much. I, I used to have this idea about uh, a school somewhere, like a little country school that just started to move by itself. 
and it just mm. started to go and it would cut through homes and streets and trees and uh, the kids would be trapped inside and it would go faster and faster. And somehow, although it has nothing to do with it, it developed into the Institute. I did have, I guess for me, I have to have a couple of different things connect. And one of the things that, that I was thinking about was this job um, that one of the characters gets. He becomes a night knocker, uh, which is an old fashioned job where you go around through a small town and you have a wind up clock and you check on the businesses and you knock on doors to make sure that the doors are locked. You rattle the knobs and that sort of thing. Uh, it's a beat cops job. It, it, one guy describes it as an analog job in a digital world yeah so i had that and then i started to think about the kid and the institute and i really wanted to write a kind of a tom brown school days in hell kind huh. of thing so <laughs> the, the how many i mean you can sort of just make note how many of you guys have already read the institute oh. okay a few so we, i do want to but not everyone so i do kind of want to be careful about spoilers but the book does have a fascinating structure in that we have when it begins it begins with this guy who's getting ready to fly to new york and the plane is too crowded and almost on impulse he decides to take the check that they're offering to anyone who wants to wait for tomorrow's flight he takes it and then instead of flying to new york the next day he begins to hitchhike north um and ultimately almost tumbles by accident into the night knocker's job. And then we proceed to leave him for almost 400 pages. Yeah. That's a little bit of a spoiler, but he, and it's this sort of mesmerizing. It's like something out of Steinbeck, like, you know, one of these Steinbeck mm -hmm. stories about, you know, a working class guy hitting the road and, and um, he gets to, he gets the night knocker job and he has adventures as the night knocker job. And then suddenly he's gone and he vanishes from the story for like 300 pages. And I, I guess what I was wondering is, did you really write that part first? No, I didn't. Actually. Okay, okay. No, I didn't. I didn't. The, the first part of the book is called The Night Knocker. This is the book that um, the Institute. And the second part is called The Smart Kid. And you started there. I started with okay. The Smart Kid. I started with Luke. And I changed it around later on. And I, what I thought, I remember this thing um, from Edgar Rice Burroughs where he says, I found this and he gives all this introduction to the story. And he says... But when you read this in five pages, I will be forgotten. Mm. And that always stuck in my mind. And I thought, well, I'm going to tell all this stuff about Tim. But if my story's good enough, you'll forget all about him until you all at once you'll say, oh, my God, there he is, my old friend Tim. Well, it also reminds me, there's two things there. It reminds me a little bit of when you read The Day of the Jackal, the very first sentence says that the jackal failed. You know, you find out he doesn't succeed in in assassinating de Gaulle and they ruin the ending of the book. Forsyth ruins the end of the book in the first sentence. But then the book is so great, you forget that the jackal isn't going to succeed. Yeah. He becomes as unstoppable as the Terminator. Well, I've always said about uh, critics, you know, people will say, do you read all the reviews? And I'll say, yeah, I usually do. And I feel like if all the critics are saying the same thing, you screwed up. But if they're all saying different things, you're okay. And I've read a lot of reviews that say, this is very odd structure to this book. And all I can say is, it seemed like the right, it seemed like a good idea at the time. So <laughs> listen, let me ask you something. Yeah. You've got this book of short stories. You collaborated with me on a couple of them. Right. And these other stories, uh, to me, a lot of them had this feeling of, Ray Bradbury and Jack Finney and some of the classic, um, yeah. some of the classic, not necessarily horror. There's horror in this book. There's some very scary things. C.S. Lewis. But yeah, well. Uh, but Fawn is, yeah. Fawn is obviously sort of a little bit of a riff on Narnia in a sense. Yeah, well, I thought it was also the thing they talk about that that Bradbury story about the uh, s a sound, sound of, of thunder. thunder. Yeah. yeah, when they they go back to hunt dinosaurs. So my question is, who influenced you in the fantasy field? We're not talking necessarily about comic books right now because I know that right. that was a big deal with you when you, right. it's always been a big deal, still is. Yeah. For actually. I mean, I talked to someone, I, I you know, I, I talked to someone about this early earlier today and, you know, um, and to be honest, it's very hard to sort of get around you and mom's work. 
you know, I mean, the fantasy and, and horror novels that shaped me were, you know, The Talisman, It, and The Dead Zone, which were like sort of the foundational books that I read when I was 13, 14, that shaped my idea about what a good story could be. Wow, that's great. Thank um, you. I did read, I mean, I mean, there was some other stuff. There was, I, there was a book of short stories by Jack Finney called... You must need a ride home. <laughs> <laughs> Well, when you were talking about critics, that reminded me of the Zach Galifianakis line. Um, you say that you're your own worst critic. Does that mean you haven't read the reviews then? <laughs> oh, snap! Oh. No, um, um, I, I read uh, um, I Love Galesburg in the Springtime by Jack Finney. I had a very nice old copy of that. Um, and, and that you know, filled out some of my ideas about what a fan, I read all the Bradbury stuff because I think everyone who writes fantasy goes through a big Bradbury phase. Later, I still love him and I'm not dissing him. I, you know, I dearly love the fiction of Ray Bradbury. I think those short stories, you know, the short stories, a lot of them you can read in as little as 10 minutes and then you can never, ever forget them. You know, stories like the Foghorn where this giant prehistoric creature falls in love with a lighthouse. Yeah, and there's something like that in... Uh in, right, and by the silver waters in, uh, of Lake Champlain. Full throttle, and it's actually going to be uh, an episode of Creep Show um, TV on TV Shutter series, along with along with one of your stories yeah. is a part of the Creep Show anthology. Which one is yours in, in well, the Creep Show? Th the thing started Creep Show started a couple of weeks ago. Gray Matter was the first story in this season series, and your story. By yeah, the Silver Waters that's one of the last. is the last one. Yeah. I figured out I was... And Joe was in Creep Show, the original movie. I was. So so the weird story about that is like, you know, so so Dad became friends with George A. Romero, an independent filmmaker, best known for Dawn of the Dead. And they were very close, and they hit on the idea of doing a film that would pay tribute to the great, gross horror comics of the 1950s you know tales from the crypt and the vault of fear and uh the most also they were these comics were hugely successful they sold millions of copies and then in the late 50s um congress and psychologists teamed up to make comics boring again and they they got rid of all the horror comics but so creep show was gonna creep show was gonna be that and um dad was cast in the film as jody verrill um, i got to play a plant yeah, yeah, yeah. He he gets this stuff on him, this substance which he calls me colorfully calls meteor shit, and then begins to turn into um, you know, begins to grass begins to grow and begins to grow grass in his eyebrows and moss on his tongue. And I think because dad didn't want to be lonely, he persuaded uh George Romero to cast me in the film as well as the little no, boy. No, it was George's idea when he saw you. He well, thought you looked so innocent and sweet. Little did he know. <laughs> I play this kid named Billy who torments his abusive father with a voodoo doll after his father takes his horror comics away from him. So it wasn't really much of an acting stretch for me. Um, but, but the thing that I remember best about it was, so my father in the film was Tom Atkins. And Tom Atkins, great, lovely man, you know, in real life, way too affable and kind, you know, to be to be hated, to be torment with a voodoo doll. But in any event, he had to wallop me one in the in the film. So he fake slaps me and then Tom Savini, the makeup artist on the film, painted a big handshake oh, no. bruise oh, no. on my face. I and so we shot going. and we shot and we shot. And back in those days, like 1982, so they didn't really have any like rules about how long a kid could shoot or anything or how late it was. <laughs> so finally, when we left, it was like two in the morning and I'm like cranked up and I began to chant, I want a milkshake. I want a milkshake. I want a milkshake. And so my my dad gave up and took me to McDonald's. And he got to McDonald's and he says, give the kid a chocolate milkshake. And then he's sitting there behind the wheel. And he Cigarette looks, in one hand. Yeah. And then he, he looks over and looks and then looks back. And there are four or five people in McDonald's in the drive-thru window. <laughs> And he suddenly realizes I still have this giant hand-shaped bruise on my face. And we're out at 2 in the morning, and it looks like he's trying to bribe me off before I call Child Protection Services. <laughs> so we didn't get to McDonald's again for the rest of that trip either, which was no, strange. Not that one, anyway. <laughs> um, questions, questions, right. So, so 
you're you're pretty well known as a prolific writer. The Institute is actually your 203rd novel um, in the last two years. But I do know, um, I know, I, thank you. I know that sometimes books stall, that you've had books. So for example, you had 80 pages of Under Could the Dome. Could you hear that? You want me to turn it up? <laughs> now go ahead. My dad goes, my dad goes, <gasps> oh look, it's a book. <laughs> so, so, so you had 80 pages of Under the Dome done and set it aside for, what, 20 years? Longer, actually, I think. Uh, when did I, you write the first, take your first whack at 72, it? 72, and uh, I did a whole bunch of work on it then, but there was too much, too much research involved. And it just kind of daunted me, so I put it aside and wrote a book about vampires called Salem's mm. Lot. <laughs> and then it's steep. I mean, it's steep for it's steep for 30, 40, 30 years? Yeah. You know, and then it was ready. There was another story about a little guy that I think you've played with off and on over the years, the little guy story. Is there, I mean, is there, I, I think people feel like you must not even have must not have any self doubts that the thing the things just when oh. when do you get so what when do you get stuck and how do you get unstuck? Oh man, I have a, a lot of self doubts. Um, I think the best thing to do is uh, when when I really run into trouble. You know, the thing is like uh, there's this is saying never let them see you sweat, and I think that. There's someone, maybe you even will know who this is. Some famous writer said, hard writing makes for easy reading. Yeah, and, it might be uh, Elmore Leonard. Uh, yeah, it could have been Elmore Leonard. But the important thing is to push through, to not become depressed. And, you know, I try to remember we're all amateurs at this. And every mm. time that I sit down, it's like the first time um, I battle doubts all the time about whether or not this thing is working or that thing's working, whether or not the idea is good. Um, the one thing that I never really doubted is the language, the ability to put the words together, but sometimes to balance things. I had the devil's own time with the Institute because by the last quarter of the book, I felt like there were all these different balls that were up in the air at the same time and are trying to make everything fit. And at the same time to make the transitions and, to not make it look like yeah. it's strange. Hard work. Yeah. Yeah. You got stuck in carry. I did. I got stuck in carry and threw it away. And my wife fished it out of the wastebasket and said that it was, she thought it was pretty good. And, and, and <laughs> my wife, Joe's mom, has this special smile that she has sometimes. <laughs> And what it does is it it's almost like a Picasso smile. It tilts her mouth one way, but not both. It's it's a very endearing smile, but I always know what it means. And when she read Carrie and she she smoothed it out and the it was covered with cigarette ashes and all this stuff, and she read it and she said, and she had a smile on her face, and she said, you know, this is pretty good. You ought to go on with it. And I thought of uh something that uh Samuel Johnson said about uh, dancing dogs, it's not that you, <laughs> that you expect to see it done well, you're surprised to see it done at all. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, I don't know anything about uh, girls' locker rooms, and they're all throwing tampons at Carrie, and I said, I don't know whether you get that from a coin-op or whatever, and she said, I will help you. <laughs> If she did. I got What's your favorite story? I got I got a Tabitha King story. I got a okay, Tabitha go King ahead, story. Go ahead. So so uh my third novel is called Nosferatu. And <laughs> thanks. It's about a bad man with a car that runs on human souls instead of gasoline. And uh and I wrote a really nasty ending. I wrote a really and I mean it was bleak. It was just like as bleak as bleak can get. And, and I decided I was going to keep it because I'm a fucking artist. 
And I knew my publisher, I knew my publisher was going to want to want me to change it. And I didn't care. I'm like, because I'm an artist. I'm going to keep it. I'm going to keep, I don't care if I sell seven copies. <laughs> That's my ending. But I would, send, I would send the book to my parents first and, and see what they think. And, and my mom read it and she called me up. She said, Joe, it's just a wonderful novel, but that ending really won't do. And I said, okay, mom. <laughs> In case, in case you wanted to know the shelf life of my artistic integrity. <laughs> what do I got in here? What do I got in here? I have a few books that I Are use. Are you guys doing okay? Are you having a... Yeah. Because, because you know what? We can't really see you that well because of the lights in our eyes. And I always look for the telltale signs of fanny fatigue. <laughs> you know, when you get there, you know, so. Uh, all right. Okay. We're all here. <laughs> um, okay, so, so I have a few books that I use as points on the creative compass. Uh, Dead Zone is one. Yeah. True Grit is another. Friends of Eddie Coyle is a third. Yep. What about you? Oh, man. Uh, I read an awful lot of books by a guy that's not read enough these days, Don Robertson. And uh, he wrote a wonderful book called, um, um, it's so wonderful that I can't even remember the name of it. <laughs> you know, the, the story about Charlie. There's uh, Paradise, Falls, Paradise, Paradise Falls. Paradise Falls. Right. And for a long time, you know, I kind of, uh, Richard Matheson was a big deal for me. We've got a story in Full Throttle that's called Throttle, and it came from a book uh, some people came to, to Joe and to me and said, we're going to do this book of stories that riff on uh, Richard Matheson's famous stories. One is Duel. It was a Steven Spielberg movie near the beginning of his career. And there was one called Nightmare at 20,000 Feet. It was a famous Twilight Zone yeah. thing. And he, so he, he's done a lot. Richard Matheson was a, a formative figure in my life. I Am Legend, uh, The Shrinking Man, all those stories. So we got together. He was a big deal for me. Robert Bloch was a big deal for me. Ray Bradbury, particularly the stories. I felt that uh, Bradbury got maybe a little tiny bit twee toward the end of his career, but the stories early on... Uh, uh, there's one called Small Assassin, um, about yeah, a baby yeah. that's a, a killer. And, is that Matheson uh, or Bradbury? That, that's Bradbury. Small Assassin is Bradbury. And my favorite one was uh, um, this kid, uh, I think it's called uh, The Visitor. And uh, I got to tell you this story because this, this really fucked me up when I was a kid. <laughs> there's this little boy named Martin uh, who is in bed because he's got this disease, he can't get out, you know, he's just sick. And so what he does, and Bradbury was at the peak of his abilities then to handle language. And he says that Martin had this dog, and he would say to the dog, uh, bring me a book from the store, and he would tell him what the thing was, and he'd tell him, to, and the, the dog would go to the proprietor, and the <laughs> thing would come back. Uh, we, he, the dog would come back with the book, or he would say, I really want to see Mrs. Jenkins, and, and she'll bring me some oatmeal cookies, and uh, the dog would bring Mrs. Jenkins back. You know, he'd have his teeth in the hem of her dress and bring her in and everything. So all this thing happened, and because he can't go to school, Martin has a tutor, and he falls in love with this beautiful young woman who comes to teach him reading and writing and arithmetic. And she's struck by a car and killed. And uh, and 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 uh, the kid is heartbroken about this, and he says to the dog, "I really miss her. I really miss her." And the dog runs away, and then the dog comes back, and he's covered with dirt and. <laughs> And crumbles of clay and everything, and he hears these shuffling footsteps <laughs> in the hallway. And the last line of the story is Martin had company. <laughs> I gotta I gotta tell a quick story about throttle and duel, but it's it's really a Steve King story. You know, um we had to write that story together. It's it's the first story in full throttle. It was written to honor the Richard Matheson novella Duel which is about an everyman on the run from a faceless trucker in a Peterbilt tanker. And uh, 
And Throttle is about an outlaw motorcycle gang on the run from uh, a faceless trucker. And uh, I, at the time, I didn't have my motorcycle license. I didn't know much about bikes. And I'm like, Dad had been riding bikes for 40 years. I thought, all right, we've got to do this together. He'll keep me, he'll keep me, you know, he'll keep me shiny side up. We'll, we, he'll get the motorcycle stuff, you know, and I, I won't sound like a fake. But I did get my motorcycle license not long after we wrote the story together. And a couple of years later in the summer, we went for a ride together. He he's always been a Harley guy, so he went out on his Harley, and I went out on my little Triumph Bonneville. And it was a beautiful afternoon. Yeah. We got to ride together for like thirty miles, and and a perfect summer day. And we got back, parked the bikes. He took a look over my bike, and he said, "That's a pretty nice ride, even if the engine does sound like a sewing machine." <laughs> <laughs> Listen. But, uh yeah. We've only got so much time, and there are questions from the audience I want to take. But I have a speed round first, so let's go ahead and hit the speed oh, round shit, real quick. Oh, shit, I hate this. I'm sorry. No, come on. Just go with me. It's going to be great. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's it. I've heard that all my life. Come on, Dan. It's going to be great. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? Man, if I could have one... <laughs> I've been asking him this question since I was four. <laughs> I guess I'd fly. What movie have you seen the most? Oh, Sorcerer, w William Friedkin. I've seen that movie. Uh, you guys, no, That's don't clap one. because you don't know the movie, but it's fucking great. <laughs> it was it was the follow-up to The Exorcist. Go ahead. What's the best LP in the history of rock? Uh, the best. Come on, man, so speed run. Many. Yeah, I know. No, all right, ACDC, Back in Black. Cool. <laughs> What's the best single? The best single is Sweet Soul Music by Arthur Conley. Mm. Book you most wish you had written and didn't. Man, fuck, there's thousands of them. I guess the book that I was most jealous of was Lord of the Rings. And I just read that and I said, this guy is so far beyond what I can do. How many games will the Sox win next year? Uh, the Sox next year are going to win 88 games. That's four more than this year, guys. Beatles or Stones? Stones. Wrong. <laughs> Spielberg or Kubrick? Spielberg. I thought so. Who's scarier, Chucky or Chucky e. Cheese? <laughs> Chuck E. Cheese. So listen. Let's do the questions uh, from the audience. Yeah, let's do the questions from the audience. Okay. Uh, what would you say is your favorite horror movie of all time? It, chapter one. Ah, that's kind of nice. All right, let's, uh, no, nah, not that. <laughs> now, can I see that one? Yeah. Bullshit. <laughs> um, let's see. By the way, I want to tell you something. You might have seen a little while ago, uh, you know, I think back to George Bush. George Bush, the senior one, lost the election because he was in a debate and he looked at his watch at some point, you know, and I, that, and I was looking at mine. But the reason was, it's this Apple watch. And uh, when I gave my, my son a hug, it says, it looks like you've had a fall. <laughs> so... All right. That's that's an app my IT guy put on the phone because obviously uh, he decided that I'm old, doddering, and going to die soon. So it said, it looks like you've had a fall, and I had to push the little button so they wouldn't call 911. <laughs> Go ahead. What do you think happens to us when we die? Debbie wants to know. I think that we go somewhere else. I think con consciousness continues. Um, yeah, that might be on the other but, side. Might be okay. on the other side. Yeah, Let's see. That's a different question. Go ahead. But answer the question. No, no, answer the I, question. I, what happens no, to us when we I, die? I don't know, man. I, th I think that, <laughs> you know, the thing is, like, we're all so cool, you know? It seems like such a waste that something happens. So that's what I choose to believe. Okay. For Joe, love the fireman. Your descriptions of Portsmouth were spot on. I was born and raised in Portsmouth. Did you ever live there? Or were your descriptions just great research? Um, 
I, I wanted to do a story that was anchored in a real place to make my outbreak of spontaneous combustion seem like a real thing. So I carefully mapped all the locations. There's a big shootout on a street. Um, at one point, the street has some kind of ridiculous name, like uh, uh, Dunkirk Street. I can't remember, and I thought, I must have made that up, and then I was in Portsmouth the other day and drove by it, so I guess I didn't. <laughs> um, Stephen, in the dark, I'm reading Stephen. Uh, in the dark tower, you include excerpts from Stephen King's diary. Were any of these based on your actual diary? <laughs> I had uh, a bunch of old diaries, but I didn't have any from the year in question, so they were totally made up. Okay, Joe, what is the most messed up thing your dad did to you as a child? <laughs> You know, There's so many to choose from. I know, it's hard, hard to decide. You know, the thing is, I've thought about this a lot because there's this old Jay Leno joke, right? And goes, uh, Stephen King asked the kids, do you want to hear a bedtime story? And the kids go, no! <laughs> but, but the thing is, is it was never really like that, you know? I mean, like, like we always love bedtime stories. You know, yeah. it was the best part of the day. I always sometimes think, like, you know, um, that it's a misunder basic misunderstanding of dad's work to imagine that he sells fear. Politicians sell fear, you know? I, I've always thought, I've always thought that my dad's stories sold bravery, that, that they essentially were making an argument that, yeah, things might get really bad, but if you have some faith and a sense of humor, and if you're loyal to your loved ones, sometimes you can kick the darkness till it bleeds daylight. Um, That's very nice. Very nice. You have written several. I will say, before, I just want to add one thing to that. I've done a lot of interviews over the time that I've done this, and people at some point will say, uh, "What were you like as a kid?" And the subtext to that question is, "What fucked you up so <laughs> much that you're doing this?" So, um, this one says. Uh, when collaborating, who gets the last word? And you have you have a lot of experience with collaboration in the sense of we wrote the two stories together in full throttle. Right. You've written several novels with uh, your with Peter Straub. Peter Straub. And, yeah. and you, you wrote a a, a, a brilliant uh, apocalyptic novel with Owen with with uh, my brother Owen. Sleeping uh, Beauties. Oh, Sleeping Beauties, which came out just a couple years ago. So when collaborating, who gets the last word? We collaborate. Well. I think that with you and me and with uh, me and Owen, Owen and I, um, we rewrote each other's stuff and we worked together so so seamlessly um, that in the end, you couldn't tell who wrote what. I mean, obviously, there's a movie on Netflix now called In the Tall Grass, um, <laughs> which is based, thank you. Jesus Christ, it's like Led Zeppelin, isn't it? <laughs> St Stairway to heaven. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. So, you know, I read the story again uh, to get ready for the movie, which is on Netflix now. You should watch it. Uh, and I couldn't tell who wrote what. I couldn't. And, and we even have discussed this, and I know that I have with Owen, too, about who had the original idea. Yeah, I genuinely have no idea who came up with the concept for in the I remember where we came up yeah, for the concept. Yeah, tell them the story about where we came we, up with it. I got, I I had come down to Florida to visit mom and dad and it was a late flight and we were driving from the airport, you know, we're driving away from the airport. I said I was hungry and uh so we pulled into um you know, uh the Colonial House of Pancakes. It was I hope. I hope. I hope, yeah. yep. International House of Pancakes and um I got hop, a, right. Yeah, got Joe. a couple got a couple uh um uh plates of flapjacks. Mm -hmm. And I hop flapjacks. Yeah. And it 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 turned out that dad had just finished working on something and as it happened I had just finished working on something and dad said, "Well, we should write something this week." No, you said we should write something this week. Okay. You said it. Well, one of us said one it. of us said it and 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 it wasn't like we had any ideas or anything we just spitballed for about 10 minutes and came up with something yeah it turned into that story and it was easy and somebody asked we did a couple of interviews for it and somebody said well how do you work together and really i mean here's the thing uh 
Joe and I have a family resemblance. We look a little bit alike, we think a little bit alike, and when we write together, it's almost like Everly Brothers Harmony, you know, because the voices aren't the same, but, but they mix rather well. And it was that way with Owen, too. Um, I got a good one for you here. Have you ever been censored? Well, in By schools, yeah, I mean. In, well, in, what about as a grown-up, though, as well, an adult? I mean, have you ever been told no? I have been, there are a couple of times when I've been uh, about titles. Uh, I've been censored by my wife, your mother. I did a, I did a book um, uh, called Dreamcatcher, and I wanted to call that book Cancer. And she said, you can't call it that. You cannot call it that. Now, I, there are other times when she had said stuff like she said, oh, you can't call this book it. The critics will call it shit. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, you can't call this book misery because the critics will call it misery. And I, I overruled <laughs> her in those cases, but she was really um, stern about that. But with the publishers, uh, I had done this book that I wanted to call Unnatural Acts of Social Intercourse. And the publisher said, absolutely not. And over dinner one night, I said, well, then, if you're really firm about it, we'll call it Full Dark, No Stars, which we did. So, look, I got a question for yeah, you. Yeah, go for it. Mm. Who is your favorite character in any one of your novels? I really liked writing about Harper and John, and I wrote did a book. I did this book, The Fireman, and um, it's an end of the world novel. It's about this pathogen that breaks out called Dragon Scale. There's, you get it on you. There's no cure, and when you start to stress out, you begin to smoke. And if you can't control your fear, you burst into flames. And uh, hospitals are burning down. Neighborhoods are going up in smoke. And there's this school nurse Harper who um, is pregnant and gets the Dragon Scale, but because she has a medical background she knows the dragon scale can't cross through the placental barrier so she has a chance to deliver a healthy child and she goes on the run she wants to stay alive nine months to deliver her child and in the course of her adventures she becomes friends with a, an englishman named john rookwood um, also known as the fireman who is also sick but he is weaponized in his his infection and he's a kind of human flamethrower and i i loved writing about the two of them i loved their banter um, I loved how much they cared about other people because I've written about a lot of nasty pieces of work and it was it was nice to spend time with people who were so caring and yeah that was good that was really cool that um, was cool would you rather fight one horse-sized duck or 100 duck-sized horses <laughs> dude I just read them I just you know, read them I mean I didn't come up with this shit you know I'm not going to answer that question because there are duck owners out there who would be feel bad about it if whichever way I answered it. So I think not. Are you ever going to let me fucking answer you, ask you a question? Yeah, go ahead. Because we're almost. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, we're, we got to be almost in. There's another one there. Well, yeah. This one says, do you have to pay your father to be able to reference his characters and places in your works? <laughs> do you want the money now? <laughs> Um, there, there's one. There's oh, one. Yeah, you asked me a bunch. There's uh, one. Thanks. If you were trapped on a... Looks like detergent island. <laughs> if you were trapped on a desert island, deserted island, which book, movie, and food would you bring? Let's start with book. Book. Which book, movie, or food would you bring? I would bring... Um, how to escape from a desert island in ten <laughs> in ten easy lesions. Yeah. And food? What food would I bring? Oh, it says this at the bottom. It says also I have socks for you and Joe. <laughs> <laughs> have you already worn them? <laughs> All right. What food on the desert island? Your what food would you? I don't know. I mean, it would get. I'd get takeout pizza and then go back with the guy. <laughs> See, thinking all the time, man. That's that imagination at work. Where Here's do you one. get those crazy ideas? Here's a good one. 
Here's a good one. It says songs and movies get re remade all the time. Uh, why isn't this the case with novels? This question was obviously asked by someone who hasn't read The Fireman and doesn't know I was just remaking The Stand. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not that's not true at all. Uh, uh, is it? Oh, I got a question for you, and it's kind of like this question, but my question is better. Um, <laughs> so you got this. You got you got a you got a. A, a book that was just a number one New York Times bestseller, uh, a hit movie, and enough ongoing TV shows to, popular, uh, to populate your own channel. Um, you also only have 24 hours in a day. How yeah. do you keep yourself from being creatively spread too thin? Well, that's a, actually a really good question, and, the, and it's a serious question. And the question is, when do you get to the end, and when do you stop and mm. is that come to a point where hopefully you and Owen and Tab, you know, my quartet, so to speak, will come to me. I say, I say, thank you. <laughs> I, I, you come to me and say, you know, dad, it's time for you to continue to write, but Keep it to yourself, <laughs> you know. But it's been it's been a fantastic time for me because usually when you get to be 60, 65 years old, um, you kind of uh, move from the center stage to the character parts or something. And you know, I've had a fantastic run the last four or five years. But so have you. And part of what's going on right now. Um, in this country and in the whole world is that for creative people, it's become a real seller's market. You've got mm. Netflix, you've got, uh, you've got Hulu, you've got the Amazon thing. Um, the, uh, Apple prime is doing a leasey story, which is going to start filming, um, in a couple of weeks. I wrote all eight episodes and Julianne Moore is going to star as Lisey. It's going to be fantastic. <laughs> going to be a fantastic thing and they're spending a bundle and so it's been fantastic you've got Nosferatu that's been uh, renewed for mm -hmm. a second yep. season uh, with Zachary Quinto and believe me this is not like the promo part of our program I'm just saying this is amazing Lock and Key is going to come on what Who Netflix. Netflix it's Netflix yeah so it's an amazing time for uh, people who are creative and uh, I've had also the least watched one of the best adaptations of my work was uh, the three seasons of Mr. Mercedes um, which is on audience network and it's like we brought a stadium show to a coffee house but that's okay it's great and it's crazy and it's it's a lot of fun so but I think that right now uh, at my age it, I've I've done a lot of work, and I, I can't say. I mean, every day is a new day, and you just try to do continue on. I think you're probably the same way, aren't you, you know? Yeah, I mean, you know, if it's still fun and people still enjoy it, you know, then I want to keep doing it. That's right, and that's probably a good place to stop. Yeah, you guys were wonderful. Thanks yeah, you so were. Thank you. Thanks for coming out here on Splab.